Welcome back to another episode of the Ink and Impact podcast. I'm Daylene Bickle, your host, and I am so honored to be here with you today to bring you another episode. Something that I continue to feel led to do through this podcast is to keep it real. That means that I am going to share about the things that writers love to hear about and the things that they might want to ignore. Please know that the things that I share, these messages, are always every bit as much for me as for anyone else listening. Today, I'm going to keep it real by talking about comparison, specifically how it hinders us and what we can do to combat it, and five ways that Jesus modeled effective marketing for our God-given messages. Are you ready? Listen in. And if you are listening on YouTube, be sure to click that subscribe button below. This spring, I've been reading through the Old Testament of the Bible. One thing that stood out to me was that after the Israelites finally entered the promised land after 40 years of wandering, they didn't all get equal portions of land. Each tribe of Israel received the amount of land that was suitable for the size of the clan that they were in. They didn't grumble about it. Why should they? Each unique plot of ground offered exactly what they needed. It got me to thinking, That's how it's supposed to be for us as writers as well. We're not all supposed to be international bestsellers. We're not all supposed to be traditionally published. We're not all supposed to write 50 different books. Maybe we're only called to write one. We're not all supposed to have podcasts. And we're not all supposed to do in-person speaking tours. But each of us is given a particular message for a particular audience in our particular seasons of life. Nevertheless, we tend to become discontent with what we have and start comparing ourselves to other writers. Please don't tell me it's just me. We often compare our messages, our audiences, our marketing strategies, our book sales, our income levels, the list could go on and on. While it's good to learn from the successes and failures of others, it's dangerous to wade into the waters of comparison. Maybe you've never struggled with comparison, but I have, and it is no fun. Jealousy and pity parties are surefire ways to stall our effectiveness as both Christians and writers. Comparison also negatively affects how we love others. Recently, I taught a lesson on 1 John 3, verses 10 through 24 to the elementary age kids at my church. And I'll read it to you now from the New King James Version. And it says... Sorry, I thought I had it pulled up here. Let me flip back a page. And yes, I still love print Bibles. They're my go-to. All right. So we are at chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And of course, it's referring to Jesus. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son Jesus Christ and love one another, as he gave us commandment. So as part of the Sunday School lesson, I was to drive home the point of true love, by giving an illustration about gift giving. And so I had wrapped up an empty box with really pretty birthday wrapping paper and put a really nice big bow on it. And so it looked really attractive to everyone. And it was kind of fun, you know, um, to see the kids' reactions whenever I said that I was giving this present to a friend, but I went to the dollar store and found the cheapest thing that I could find right? And I'm giving it to this person because I know that whenever my birthday rolls around, they're going to give me something really, really nice in return, right? And so some of the kids' eyes got really wide, like, wow, you know, that doesn't sound very nice, right? And so some of the other points that I shared were how we shouldn't, you know, pick us, pick out the cheapest gift at the store for our loved ones or for our neighbors or for our friends. And we shouldn't stop giving gifts to people simply because they don't give us any gifts in return, right? And we shouldn't give gifts to impress others and not just the recipient. Nor should we give priority to our, uh, in our gift giving to those who can give us better gifts in return. And we shouldn't give gifts grudgingly, you know, only giving because we're obligated to, it's expected, Right. I think that applies to us as writers as well, particularly when it comes to social media. For example, maybe we record something randomly on the fly or slap something together quickly on Canva without much thought. It's the equivalent of a cheap gift. Or we stop following people who don't follow us back. Maybe we only share things that we feel will impress others. You know, those things that we own or those really cool places that we go, you know, that perfectly curated feed that we worked so hard to put together. Maybe we go out of our way to offer extra value to particular people in our niche we believe might benefit us in some way. Or maybe we share grudgingly. We don't want to be on social media, but everyone in the industry says that's how we're supposed to market our books. So, well, all right, I'll just go ahead and do it. Here we go. Does any of that resonate with you? I hate to admit that I have stumbled in a couple of those areas myself. If we're honest, sometimes our focus online isn't to share our God-given story or help others or love others, but to instead gain more followers, impress others, and get more email subscribers. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting more followers and email subscribers or, well, we really shouldn't impress anyone at any time. But there's nothing wrong with getting more followers and email subscribers, but it's the intent behind it. Is that the only reason we're doing what we're doing? That's when it can become a problem. <clears throat> Let me ask you, what is your real motivation behind being on social media and marketing your books in general? Are you trying to be liked by so-and-so, whether it's that literary agent that you have your eye on, whether it's the editor at that publishing company that you really want to work with? Are you trying to be liked? Another question is, are you simply trying to please others? and doing what you think they want? Or are you on social media and marketing your book to humbly share your God-given message? 
So now that we've gotten real and maybe a bit uncomfortable, let's turn to Christ and look to him as our marketing model. And I think there are five ways that he models marketing for us. First, Jesus went to where the people were. He didn't expect them all to come to him. He went to the synagogues. He went to the cities. He went to the small towns. He went to the countryside. He spoke in people's homes and outside on riverbanks. He spoke one-on-one -on -one privately to people and one-to-many in public crowds. Where are you going to engage with your readers? Are you going anywhere at all? Or are you just simply sitting there waiting for them to come to you? The second way that Jesus modeled marketing for us is that he customized his message to his various audiences. The chances are good that you have an ideal reader, but you also have some outliers as well. For example, as a book coach, I serve indie authors of all ages and stages of the writing process. Those who have been writing a while are familiar with a lot of the industry terminology and um, processes and strategies that I talk about. But those who are just getting started or have never written a book would have no idea what certain terms mean. So it's best for me to customize my message to those two different audiences so that one isn't bored and one isn't confused. The third way that Jesus models marketing for us is that he spoke truth in love and acted in love. So are you skipping the tough parts of your message so that it will be better received by a wider audience? Or maybe you're sharing the truth of your message, but in a way that's more self-righteous and judgmental than humble and helpful. If you're not sure how your message is coming across, ask a trusted mentor to listen to your message and share honestly about how they perceived it. A fourth way that Jesus modeled marketing for us is that he confidently shared his message, not just once or twice, but regularly. So my toes are stepped on with this one. I'm notorious for hesitantly sharing once about something and then moving on to something else, another topic. Often, especially when it comes to social media, it's because I don't have time to schedule you know, um, supplementary or corresponding posts over a period of days or weeks. This is where a VA or social media manager would be extremely beneficial, but I'm not there yet. Another reason, though, is because I think that people will tire of hearing similar messaging from me, similar content over and over again. I know from research that that's not true, but that's how my mind perceives it, right? Maybe, again, it's just me. I don't know. You'll have to let me know. But yet another reason that I don't share regularly is fear. You know, if I stay small and don't put myself or my message out there regularly, there will be less of a chance of being mocked or ridiculed, which ties into the final point, the final way that Jesus models marketing for us, which is Jesus didn't expect everyone to follow him or get, in air quotes, his message to understand his message. As a recovering people pleaser, I tend to want everyone to like me including on social media. And yes, I know that's not rational. I know that's not possible. And I'm trying to get better about it. But the, you know, the reality is that I still battle this sometimes. And the other reality is that numbers of followers really don't mean much. They don't. Even traditional publishers now understand that engagement the conversations that happen between people online, that is what's most important, not just a number of clicks or likes or a, a number of followers. So I'm speaking to myself when I say, don't expect everyone to like you, follow you, or agree with your message. People said negative things to Jesus, and they'll say negative things to us and about us and our messages. But that's not supposed to stop us from stepping out in faith and sharing our stories. 
May we be willing to share freely. May we stop striving and simply share out of a desire to help others. May the words we speak bring joy, hope, and truth to our listeners. And finally, as the Apostle John wrote in verse 18, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That is it for today, fellow pen pushers. Thank you for listening. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe button so that you don't miss any future episodes. There's also a back catalog of videos you can watch over on YouTube. And of course, you can go to the website inkandimpact.com to read the blog version, get any links that are shared in any episode, and to listen to the audio version as well. So thank you so much. Have a blessed week.